And okay. I think it's time to clear yes. out some uh, misconceptions here. Yeah. We want to do it. a few misconceptions. The first, there are some misconceptions going on about the merge right now. I think we're going to focus on maybe five things, five misconceptions the merge. Uh, do you want to take the first one? Yeah, the first one is that stakers get unburnt fees. And so not all of Ether is burnt in a transaction fee. Uh, it's, and, and in proof of stake, it's about, uh, it actually doesn't change uh, versus proof of work versus proof of stake. EIP 1559 on average burns about 75% of a transaction fee. In the future, stakers will get this 30%. So unburnt fees, tips on the execution layer will be sent to stakers. That's pretty awesome. I don't, yeah. I don't know that many people know that. Post merge, if you stake, you actually get those tips. You yes. get the transaction fees. Passive income. Um, in, addition, this. in addition to new Ether that's minted as a block reward, you also get 30% of all transaction fees, which you, in bull markets can be very significant. Absolutely. Um, the second thing I wanted to highlight, this is a misconception. A lot of people think that once they, uh, once the merge happens, that they will be able to withdraw their ETH from the staking contract. Uh-uh, can't. <laughs> not post-merge, okay? Not immediately, immediately yeah. post-merge, mm -hmm. I should say. So staking an ETH right now is a one-way ticket. It still will be post-merge. You will not be able to withdraw your ETH post-merge. There will be another update that happens. I don't know, this could be three months later, six months later, Six is the uh, estimation that I've heard, yeah. So we'll have to see how long it takes. But at that point in time, you'll be able to withdraw, but not immediately. I think there's some pros to this, which is, uh, a lot of people are saying, well, post-merge, a bunch of the staked ETH is going to get sold. No, it's still going to be locked. Yep. It's going to be locked up. But also keep in mind that when you stake, that ETH is going to be locked. It's a one-way ticket. You're not going to be able to withdraw your ETH post-merge. So that's the second misconception to clear up. Yeah, the alpha here is that post-merge, there is zero net new Ether introduced into the secondary market. The block reward issuance is going to stakers, which is locked because they can't withdraw. The fees are going to stakers, which is locked because they can't withdraw. The reason why they can't withdraw is just reduce complexity uh, one step at a time. This is a very big deal to merge to proof of stake. And so we're just keeping it simple, doing one thing at a time, letting things sit, letting things stabilize. Uh, and then merge. the withdrawals will be unlocked roughly six months later. Uh, in that time, in those that six months, staking this, the yield on staking goes from like five percent to probably like fifteen percent, and the demand to stake will be three x because the yields are going to be three times higher, and so there's going to be three times more demand to stake ether, pull ether out of the secondary market to stake it, and no ability to withdraw for six months. Um, bullish, <laughs> <laughs> bullish. <laughs> uh, I think so as well. Why don't you take the the next one, number three, the yeah. third misconception. The th the merge will not reduce gas fees. I think people got this conflated when we started talking about Ethereum 2 versus Ethereum 1. And once we merge, we're at Ethereum 2. That's no longer the case. Sharding will reduce gas fees, but that's later. That is phase two. This is currently phase one, which is the merge. Um, so the merge is not going to reduce gas fees. Uh, I'll take the next one. Um, this is just a reminder. I think if you've been listening to Bankless, you probably know this, but the ETH issuance is about to drop from 4.3% in proof of work to 0.43%. That's a smaller number. It's crazy, though. It's a lot 4. smaller. 4.3% yeah. to 0.43%. This is far lower than Bitcoin, mm -hmm. like post halvings. It'll take it's many low, years. lowest of any blockchain. By, by the far. lowest of any by blockchain. And that 0.43%, a significant portion of that is going to be burnt. That's where we get to ultrasound money, deflationary ETH as an asset. Because if the amount of ETH burnt exceeds 4.3%, then we're in deflationary territory, negative ETH burnt uh, on the year. So think about that, 4.3% to 0.43%. That is the ETH issuance in the post-merge world. Here, you want to do some comparisons, Ryan? The current yeah. ETH issuance rate, inflation rate, is 4.3%, as you just said. Solana is a little bit above 9% in inflation rate. And Avalanche, as we said earlier, is at 26% inflation rate. Both Solana and Avalanche are proof of stake, but their much higher issuance rate comes from their uh, the, mono, the, the centralized monolithic blockchains that they have. They have so much throughput that they need to issue a ton of currency in order to secure that very high rate of block space issuance 
more, the more you create block space, the, the more you have to spend on security because you have more block space to secure. Because they are very, very high throughput blockchains because they're centralized, they have to issue a ton. Ether, Ethereum is, is much, more, uh, much more limited in block space because we want to maintain decentralization at the base layer. That's how you do that. Therefore, it doesn't have to issue as much. So it's as low as 4.3%. The point though, Ryan, of why I'm doing this is that this is comparison 4.3% of Ethereum in proof of work mode in comparison to other proof of stake blockchains. And so when Ethereum joins Solana and Avalanche in proof of stake, it's going to be 0.43% inflation rate on Ether versus Solana's inflation rate of 9% versus uh, Avalanche's inflation rate of 26%. These are, we are in different it's categories. Just killer, it's, it's, it's just different killer categories. economics, man. And that's it's, not including the burn. That's not including <laughs> the burn. <laughs> well, let's talk about the, the fifth misconception and uh, why don't you do this last one? Mm. Uh, yeah, this is a good one. Running a node post-merge does not require any ETH. You can be either a staking validating node and you can add transactions to the blockchain or you can be a listening node and you can uh, send your own transactions to the mempool via your own node but you do not in order to run your own node you do not need to add any eth to it it is it is free and accessible to anyone to run a node uh, did you know did you know that's not actually true Ryan for avalanche I know I'm, I'm trying to not be an eth maxi here but like in order to run a node on avalanche you have to be a validator you have to be a validator in order to access the mempool and see what's going on in the mempool to participate to in M yeah you have to stake at avalanche tokens which is reminiscent to order flow if for people that own the shares of the network it's a it's a it's concerning to me as to the the gating of that information away from the public because the public can't run their own avalanche node yeah, I am also concerned about that. Yes. Uh, but this point is really important because some people say, no, well, it's going to cost thousands of dollars worth of ETH to run a node. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's just costs hardware nope. and anyone can run it from a consumer machine. Yep. Uh, that's, by the way, always been a case. Yes. Anyone can run a node on Ethereum today. Just uh, go download Geth and set it up, yep. um, DAP node or something else. Mm -hmm. uh, David, you know what's cool about this, these misconceptions, is they're starting to fade on the institutional side. Okay, so people are starting to get it. I don't have a Bloomberg terminal or a subscription or whatever is required, but uh, there is now an analyst at Bloomberg who covers Ethereum, and he is writing some fire content about Ethereum. Uh, and there, there are a few articles that someone forwarded me this week. This is one on the how Ethereum is transitioning to a global asset. This article absolutely nails it. Uh, there's another article on how. The DCF model suggests the network asset for Ethereum, ETH, is undervalued. We just did some episodes with Ryan, Alice, and others on the DCF model we for did, Ethereum. We did our DCF model with Justin Drake over a year ago. Yes, we did that we over like, a year ago as our well. Our conclusion was that I think Ether might be undervalued. <laughs> This is what this analyst says too. Conservatively, Ether could be worth 6,100. Well, you plug in whatever numbers in the DCF and you spit something out, but it's sure a lot higher than it is today, <laughs> depending on the, the numbers you put in. But like any obvious number, it'll be higher. And then here's an entire Bloomberg article on the, the merge, how the merge will be a super catalyst. I guess all this to say is the institutions are starting to get it. And it's funny to me because we've been talking about the the value proposition, ETH is a triple point money for like probably two years, I would say, like longer than that if you go back, but on Bankless for about two years. And it's interesting to me to see kind of the lag time of like institutions mm -hmm. starting to get on board and starting to understand this these narratives. This is um, from our friends at One River Asset Management, and they, they bought one of the biggest Bitcoin buys in history mm -hmm. about a year and a half ago. It's like they are uh, an institutional hedge fund who is now very crypto focused. Uh, this is what they say about Ether. Ether is being transformed into a low-risk bond asset, and it is cheap. Remember, Ethereum, the internet bond? Remember all those articles we wrote about? Right. Remember what we were talking about? I remember. Uh, the largest institutional investors are now saying it, okay? It is increasingly clear, this is a quote, that the future of finance runs on Ethereum with ETH as a reserve asset to the ecosystem. The institutions are now repeating it. Uh, the narrative is cementing. Still an early set of institutions, but mm -hmm. it's out there now. Um, we did our job. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I've been hammering about as to one of the most underappreciated aspects of proof of stake with EIP-1559 and basically Ethereum versus Bitcoin is like Bitcoin is really hard to value. It's hard to put like numbers and models around demand for Bitcoin. Uh, it's just like, it's, do you take it on faith that people value this is really the Bitcoin investment thesis. 
with with Ethereum, you have the issuance rate, you have the burn rate, you have the stake rate, uh, you have like active addresses for in DeFi, you have demand for Ether in DeFi. There's so many metrics and numbers, especially when like there's first off the appropriate numbers to actually make a DCF analysis, which is very comfy zone for institutions. But the sheer number of just things to measure, metrics for Ether the asset, just is enabling institutions to be comfortable. It makes it feel like it's in their wheelhouse, which kind of is, uh, and it's definitely one of the most bullish things about Ether. It's like you can actually reason about it with metrics and numbers rather than just like uh, ex assuming that there's going to be sufficient demand for an asset. Yeah, they're like, oh yeah, we know bonds, we yeah. know we know equities, and we know capital assets. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this thing performs like a bond, like mm -hmm. an equity, like a capital asset. Okay, we can value that thing. And oops, when we plug it in the spreadsheet, mm -hmm. it spits out a much higher price than the price of ETH now. That's I mean, what's going on. Look at look at that. We look at the words that they use: low risk bond asset, and it is cheap. I know. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. <laughs> Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.